2017 has been an interesting year for O2 in the UK with majorly increasing data consumption per customer on the background of having comparatively little spectrum per user at the same time. But in order to cope with this rapidly increasing data consumption and relative lack of spectrum, O2 has developed and deployed a range of solutions during the year in order to better help them cope with this oncoming storm of data consumption. The first thing that I will talk about is the 2100 MHz ReFarm. So O2 owns 10 MHz paired of 2100 MHz which previously was used to broadcast two 3G carriers one on UARFCN of 10637 and one on 10661. However, in order to provide more LTE spectrum, they have been gradually refarming the 2100 MHz in areas from 3G occupation onto LTE or more commonly known as 4G. Typically, the first step in this process is the formation of a second 3G carrier on 900 megahertz spectrum. So the first 900 megahertz 3G carrier that exists across the network is on UARFCN 2963. And the second that is formed uses the UARFCN of 3012. And then after that appears, usually shortly afterwards, the partly refarmed 2100 megahertz 4G also appears using either the EARFCN of 222 or 224 and this leaves 5 MHz of spectrum for 3G. The final step is completely refarming the 2100 MHz and therefore getting rid of that single 3G carrier to do a full 10 MHz LTE carrier on the 2100 MHz spectrum which bears the EARFCN of 199. I believe Lincoln was the first city to get the fully refarmed 2100 MHz spectrum and together with the existing band 20 and band 3 deployment in the city means that a number of sites have now 25 MHz paired effectively of LTE spectrum operating on them which does lead to actually some pretty good performance as you can see from these screenshots taken on a site serving the city centre. All of the carriers are performing well. Unfortunately, my device at the time did not support any carrier aggregation combinations with band 1. Therefore, it's just band 1 and also band 20 and band 3 done separately. But as you can see, even with a single carrier device, the performance that you'd get is pretty impressive, really. And this is spreading more and more widely now. So most of Leicester has been fully refarmed in terms of 2100 MHz and cities like Nottingham are currently at 5 MHz refarm stage but of course in time especially with the push at the start of sort of new years we should be able to see the complete refarm of 2100 MHz spreading much more widely across the UK during the course of 2018. The next major thing that O2 did in 2017 was test TDD 2300 MHz, which is band 40 LTE, on a number of sites in and around the Slough area, including, perhaps unsurprisingly, on the roof of their headquarters in Slough. 2300 MHz, or 2.3 GHz, is spectrum that is due to be auctioned off by Ofcom, hopefully at the start of 2018. 40 MHz will be available in four blocks of 10 MHz. It's time division duplex spectrum, so it's not paired. So it's each block is like one by 10 MHz, and therefore there are a number of different combinations that mobile network operators could end up with. I sincerely hope that they will be able to end the process with at least two 10 MHz blocks of the 2.3 GHz so that they can run a 20 MHz TDD carry on it at the least. The trial masts in Slough are interesting beyond just the fact that they were broadcasting 
2.3 GHz on a trial license, there are a number of other configurational traits which point them out as being a little bit special. To start off with, Huawei remote radio units were used for the 2300 MHz transmission, which is rather strange when you look at the O2 network deployment as a whole, which very heavily features Nokia as a radio access network vendor. This is especially true in the most built up area perhaps of their deployment region in the UK, which is London, where O2's vendor is Nokia. The most interesting feature of the trial deployments, however, is the use of 88R MIMO on the masts. Now you'll notice that these antennas which I've shown have a significant number of feeders going into them. Eight of the feeders are for transmit and receive on the so 2.3 GHz side of things to make up the 88R configuration. And the ninth feeder is a calibration feeder for setting up the beamforming configuration. Beamforming with 88R MIMO will provide a colossal capacity boost even with just 20 MHz of TDD spectrum. So if these masks are a sign of the future, the future does look really quite positive for O2 in terms of ability to deploy capacity on a well relatively widespreading frequency in the near future. While on the topic of O2 and Nokia, unwound sites have been appearing, such as this one in South London. Now, South London, in terms of the Beacon project, was a Vodafone area, so Vodafone was in charge of building a sort of shared LO8 network there using Vodafone's preferred vendor, which was Ericsson. However, on a site like this, there is Nokia as the base station vendor, just O2 broadcasting on it. And as you can see from the screenshots, there is L08 and L18, using L18 as a primary carrier, which explains why the upload speed is a little bit low on the speed test screenshot there. But these are a sign of kind of what's happening in London at the moment, where Vodafone O2 are kind of splitting away from the shared network agreement and building their own site, doing very much what they want in order to build the best network that they can. Although, having said this, a recent Vodafone temporary site deployed in central London was also broadcasting O2 services, including Philly refarmed Band 1 LTE and Band 3 as well. As we can see from this screenshot, there are four transmit antennas on the mast side, so it's actually a 44R deployment on band 1 and band 3 from the O2 side of things on a Vodafone base station. So clearly there is still a strong agreement of network sharing between the providers, however in certain areas, in certain circumstances, the network share is not quite so highly integrated as it maybe was previously. Up until this point in the video I have been explaining O2's macro cell strategies they have developed and deployed during the course of 2017, but now I will move on to densification orientated strategies such as the use of small cells and micro cells. Possibly the biggest announcement and project in this department during the year was the City of London Corporation and TTIL small cell and Wi-Fi deployment on lampposts. Now this is quite extensive in the City of London now this deployment and it features CCS MetNet for self-organising backhaul, Cisco AC wireless APs that are obviously dual band alongside Nokia small cells as well, which currently are doing L18402. For the eagle-eyed amongst you, you will see that the EARFCN of O2's band 3 on the small cells is 1228 compared to 1226, which is usually seen. This allows things like separate reselection parameters between the macro cell band 3 and the small cell band 3.
far outside of the City of London, there is another small cell project that O2 is undertaking, this time in the City of Aberdeen, which is a project between the Wireless Infrastructure Group and Comscope, together with the local council. And this small cell deployment features CloudRAN, where a number of small cells are connected to a centralised baseband unit over high-speed, low-latency fibres. The final densification strategy that I will talk about is the ever-increasing deployment of spectrum bands on O2's microcell portfolio. In prior years, the microcells would typically have had things like 2G900 MHz on them or 3G2100 MHz, but some of the microcells now can have pretty much every, if not every, FDD spectrum band that O2 possesses deployed on them. So you'd have 900 megahertz doing 3G and perhaps 2G, 2100 megahertz doing 3G and 4G for now, but obviously that would become completely 4G in time. And then there's obviously 1800 megahertz, which has long since been revarmed. And then of course there's also 800 megahertz as well. So quite an extensive spectrum deployment for microcells, and this means there can be quite a number of boxes deployed on a wall depending on how exactly they do it and whether they use diplexers. I mean, a full deployment of FDD spectrum onto microcell boxes can sometimes only involve two boxes if they diplex the 800 and 900 and the 1800 and 2100. However, in some cases, a number more boxes are used for less, such as in the example here, which was doing 2100 MHz, 800 MHz and 1800 MHz. The middle box is doing the 1800 MHz and emits two beams, so this microcell has two sectors of 1800 MHz and then one sector for 2100 and 800 MHz. These densification strategies involving Wi-Fi and microcells and small cells are all very useful for combating the effects of very localised high load on a mobile network, especially one with relatively small amounts of spectrum and therefore you really want to try and get as much load off the wide serving macro cells as possible and micro cells and small cells provide the ability to do that. During the course of the year O2 has done some perhaps slightly more hidden things to their network such as supporting IMS services like voice over LTE and Wi-Fi calling on specific handsets, but natively, so no app is required. Volti is only available in certain areas at the moment, but it is rapidly spreading and major cities are covered. Meanwhile, Wi-Fi calling, like I say, works if you've got a suitable handset. A number of sites also show configuration setup for 64 gram upload. On other networks, the presence of 64-cram upload being enabled on the site is also indicative of 256-cram downlink. So potentially O2 does have 64-cram uplink and 256-cram downlink enabled on a certain segment of their site portfolio. However, as of the production of this video, I've been unable to track down or test this. So O2 has got up to quite a lot in the year 2017, which is completely unsurprising when it's taken into mind how rapidly rising the data consumption on their network is. And with that, the outcome of the Spectrum auction, which will hopefully happen in early 2018, will potentially be quite make or break for their network data performance going forward.